When a Lion Air flight took off from Jakarta at 6.20 a.m., October 29th, 2018, it was just 13 minutes later it plunged into the sea, killing every single person on board. We're watching for word on what might have caused yesterday's crash of a Lion Air jet. About five months later, a second plane would crash over Ethiopia. Again, everyone on that flight died. What brought down Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302? Critically, in both cases, it was the same type of plane involved, the Boeing 737 MAX 8. In the months that followed, we would learn more about not just those two catastrophic failures, but about the series of cascading failures, one after another, that led to the crashes. From a key modification to the plane that few pilots knew existed, let alone understood, to a head office that was slow to act when they began to understand just how flawed their plane really was. We are sorry. Those details have come to a head before U.S. lawmakers, where for days the head of Boeing, Dennis Mullenberg, was grilled about his corporation's failure to prevent either of the crashes. And families, too, have said their piece. The decisions that they made before and after the first crash uh, caused the deaths of my family. Now, we will surely learn more in the coming months. And Boeing says in a matter of months, the MAX 8 will fly again. But the question then will be, now what? Every Friday, we take our second look at a story from the week and try to break it down in a way that's interesting, insightful, and empowering. So tonight, we're going to try to understand what was at the heart of those two crashes, what happens once Boeing says it solved the problem, and then as flyers, what are we supposed to do at the end of the day? Carry on like nothing happened? We have help joining us from across Canada and the U.S. Natalie Kitroeff of the New York Times, who's been reporting on the Boeing disasters extensively. We have Raymond Hall, aviation lawyer and former Boeing pilot in Vancouver tonight. And Gabor Lukacs, passenger rights advocate, joining us from Halifax. Hello to all of you. Let's start with Boeing's bottom line. The company's profits have soared in recent years. Look at this, $5 billion in 2016, $8.5 billion in 2017, 10 and a half billion in 2018. Then a steep drop in the 12 months leading up to September of this year. Boeing's profits only about $3.8 billion. Natalie, as we try to understand Boeing, I mean, the numbers certainly tell us about the opportunity in this industry. What have we learned about Boeing, the company? So we know that global aircraft manufacturing is essentially a duopoly. You have Boeing and Airbus. And at the time that Boeing was launching this plane, the 737 MAX, it was under intense pressure because it faced an unthinkable defection. American Airlines was about to place a huge order with Airbus. Now, Boeing had to rush to, in order to keep up with Airbus. It was months behind. And so time pressure and competitive pressure played an enormous role in the development of this plane. Right. We and, know also that the company... And Well, I was just going to say, and, and on a technical level, I mean, how, how did those pressures affect the plane itself? I mean, th th there was one system that controlled the pitch of the plane that was particularly vulnerable, right, to a single specific weakness. Right. So Boeing introduced a new system on this plane called MCAS, which contributed to both crashes. The reason it needed this system was in order to make the plane fly like its predecessor. The system pitched the nose of the plane down. Um, Boeing was trying to limit training for pilots on this plane, again, in order to satisfy its airline customers. And so it never informed pilots that this system existed, and pilots were never trained on it when they began flying the plane. Raymond, is it, is it fair to say that, that that weakness of the plane might not have led to those two crashes? Had pilots known about that weakness to begin with? I think there are two aspects to it. First of all, you have to know uh, that it's there and you have to know how it works and what corrective action to take in the, in the event that the action is inappropriate at the time, particularly when it's relying on a sensor that is faulty. Uh, Gabor, one other thing I want to ask you about. We also learned about the working relationship between the FAA and Boeing. Uh, you know, one is supposed to oversee the other. D does it really work that way? Unfortunately, what we have witnessed here is a common problem in the airline business and in other areas, simply described as regulatory capture, where the body which is supposed to supervise, exercise oversight over a particular industry is starting to act in the interest of the industry and not in the interest of the public. 
Natalie, how, how, in your work, I mean, what have you learned about how that actually works, that relationship? Well, the FAA, the regulator in the United States, hands over much of the responsibility for determining the safety of an aircraft to Boeing. And in this case, the FAA never received a safety assessment of this system, MCAS. So um, investigations have determined that the regulator was not fully aware of how it worked when it cleared the plane to fly. Okay, let's talk about where all of this leads. Um, right now, we don't actually know exactly when the MAX 8 will be recertified to fly, but take a look. Air Canada says it's going to keep its MAX 8s out of its schedules until at the earliest February 14th of next year. WestJet says it's pulling its MAX 8s at least until January 5th, 2020, and Sunwing says it expects to have its MAX 8s back in mid-May 2020. But, but maybe we should start with even a more basic question than that. Will the MAX 8 fly again. Raymond, yes or no and why? Yes, it will. Uh, once the problem is analyzed, determined and fixed, it will fly again. And I anticipate that they will come pretty close to meeting that schedule. And the reason that I suspect that is because when the MCAS system was originally designed, not for this aircraft, but for the uh, a Boeing fuel freighter for military fighter jets, that system incorporated the systems that this a particular system avoided on three aspects the ability to know it's there the ability to control the aircraft and the uh, number of times that uh, the system intervenes when they change it which they are going to do to to put it back to the system that was originally designed in the military freighter aircraft which has had no incidents whatsoever I expect that the certification will come together after a su sufficient amount of testing and uh, a thorough investigation by not only the FAA but the uh, foreign regulators as well. Right, and, and you know, Boeing CEO, I mean, he said in a, in a written statement that when the 737 MAX returns to service, it will be one of the safest airplanes ever to fly. You think that's true? Uh, it could very well be. In fact, I uh, did not fly it, of course, because it, it arrived after I retired from Air Canada. But I flew as a passenger on it several times, and I love the airplane itself. Uh, say, save for this problem that is really a, a systemic problem in the, in the certification, design and certification. Save for that problem, it's a fantastic airplane. If, if the MAX 8 is approved to fly again in the United States, does that mean it'll fly again in Canada? It, it, obviously, Transport Canada is going to have a major role here, and particularly since recently the FAA has been legally precluded from uh, doing the certification. It's all since the uh, last year been delegated to the manufacturers. So I expect that Transport Canada will have to have a, a very active role in, in determining that the uh, recertification in the United States is correct and that, the, that we are satisfied that it is safe to fly here. And, and how soon would all of that happen? I, I would expect it would happen at the very beginning of next year. In fact, I understand that Air Canada is planning to start pilot training to refresh everybody at the beginning of the year, be well before the February 14th uh, uh, introduction in the schedule if it proceeds at that point. Okay. Um, now, having max eights in the flight rotation, of course, is one thing, but whether people will actually want to fly in them, that's a whole other question. You're going to hear from Paul Gerogate right now. He lost five members of his family in the second crash, including his wife and three kids but I want you to listen to a part of a phone conversation that he had with one of our CBC reporters, Laura Lynch, on the question of whether he would feel safe flying a Boeing 737 MAX 8 again in the future. But if the regulate, international regulatory bodies do their own reviews and uh, certainly um, say that it can be approved to fly again, then um, I, I think um, um, we, can, we can trust that. But we would want... Uh, the uh, public disclosure of what um, a Boeing has done in order to improve safety of the 737 MAX. So, so that is striking coming from someone who has lost family members uh, in one of those crashes. So the question, to fly or not to fly. Um, the three of you, could I just uh, you know, do a quick round here? Natalie, once the FAA certifies this plane to fly again, and, and you know, in the Canadian case, Transport Canada makes that decision, would you fly on one of these planes? 
I mean, I frankly think that the vast majority of passengers in this case are going to be the ones to decide this question. I will say that Mr. Mullenberg said this week it will be the most heavily scrutinized plane in history. And I don't know that that's an exaggeration. I do think that this is the most thorough process, this recertification process that we've seen in a long time. And Raymond and Gabor, your takes. Raymond, quickly. I second that opinion. In fact, uh, it is no, there is no question that the, the scrutiny on this aircraft is, is far greater than any of the other aircraft that have ever been certified. Gabor, um, how much power do people have to decide whether they get on a Boeing 737 MAX 8 if they buy a ticket for one? Unfortunately, people are quite powerless in this regard because once the aircraft is certified, it is uh, the airline's decision which aircraft they use. The problem is how it is going to be recertified, and I'm quite concerned that Canada may be too quick to follow the FAA in that. I would want to hear from the European uh, authorities and from Australia, at the very least, to see what they have to say about the recertification before I would feel comfortable with Canada recertifying the aircraft. And, and Gabor, once you've booked a flight on one of these planes, can you say, no, I, I actually don't want to fly on the MAX 8, book me on a different flight? Unfortunately, passengers don't have the power to tell the airline which aircraft they want to fly on. The airlines do have the right to swap an aircraft, even if when you buy the ticket, it looks like you are flying on an Airbus, they can swap it later on to a uh, Boeing and the Boeing 737 MAX 8. Natalie, though, I, I want to give you maybe the final word, how you think people will see this entire saga that's unfolded and how it might affect the future. My sense is that the lasting legacy of these crashes, and you know, I think it's something that the family members of the victims want, is going to be a more urgent move towards structural change in how we approve aircraft in this country and perhaps across the world. The Europeans delegate to industry as well, and I think that's being looked at very carefully in this country. And we are on the brink, I think, of potentially major changes about how we determine the safety of aircraft. I think that will be the lasting legacy here. Natalie, Raymond, Gabor, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.